Responsibility. The future doesn't just take care of itself, folks. Who do you think made this a better America? People who understood the future because they believed they mattered. If you want to change things, you've got to act. But how, how can we act? We don't matter. The only time people don't matter is when they stop believing they matter. What did you tell me before? You know something nice. <laughs> you mean that I'm beautiful? No. <laughs> you mean I'm not beautiful? No, I didn't say that. Well, you better say something. <laughs> All right. I love you. I love you. Oh, John. For taking the situation comedy form to a place no one dared go before, for speaking out about his country and his fellow man, and paying much more than lip service to the values that made America great, for allowing us the rare privilege of seeing ourselves, warts and all, and for dealing with subjects that were previously taboo in a humorous and intelligent way, the Television Academy is proud to welcome, as a member of the Hall of Fame, Mr. Norman Lear. Thank you very much. I am more than deeply honored, more than a little stunned, to be on the receiving end of, of tonight's ceremony and in this company. And to the extent that my feet are on the ground at all, I have my mother to thank. My mother has her own way of helping me keep things in perspective. I, I called her when I had word of this in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I said, Mother, they're taking me into the Hall of Fame. And I recited the names of the other inductees, Lucille Ball and Milton Berle and General Sonoff and William Paley, Edward R. Murrow and Patty Chayefsky. And me, I said. And my mother took a beat and then she said, listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> You just, saw, you just saw some of the brilliant performers that gave life and blood to the television characters with which I have been associated. They represent half of a giant collaboration. The other half I share with the dozens of writers and producers and directors whose careers merged with my own through the years and whose talents and insights are represented in so much that you honor here this evening. My hope for the future of television is that it will take itself as seriously as it is taken. That the time will come when all of us, all of us including networks, will look to our creative and our human instincts to create and to program instead of following the dictates of flow charts and research and overnight ratings and the pursuit of instant success. Robert, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote that to travel hopefully is a better thing than to arrive. With that in mind, I wish to thank you for this marvelous, this wonderful stop along the way. And I look forward to traveling hopefully with all, with hopefully with all of you in television, my friends and my collaborators, 
to a future in which television fills out its incredible silhouette and fulfills the promise it holds for us all. My dearest, darling family, I thank you. My partner and associates, I thank you. This wonderful medium of television, all of the Academy, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one of America's outstanding news commentators, Mr. Eric Severide. It would be hard to think of anything new to say about Edward R. Murrow, but those of us who worked with him, loved and respected him, have personal memories that never grow old. I'm one. I reached England in the fall of 37, coming by bus and freighter from the Midwest with a bride and one suitcase between us. And we were invited to dine at the Queen Anne Street apartment of the luminous young couple, Ed and Janet Murrow. He was the CBS European director of radio talks. That is, he got other people to broadcast over his network, never himself, not them. In his apartment was a big, clumsy-looking wooden cabinet with a glass screen about seven by five inches. Murrow twisted a couple of knobs, and a film story began to unfold on the little screen. It was Journey's End, the World War I drama. And Murrow pointed to that screen and said, that's television. That's the future, my friend. In the months that followed, I forgot about the gadget, but not about the man. He hired me in Paris, soon after he began his own broadcasting career as what I persist in thinking was one of the three most influential human voices in the greatest war of all time. The other two were Churchill and Roosevelt. Night after night, Ed prowled the exploding streets of London on foot or in his little open car. He'd never go down in a shelter. And he'd fly on bombing night raids over Berlin and return to the BBC studio ghost white, uh, utterly drained, but the voice addressing Americans never broke stride. Hello, America. This is Edward Murrow speaking from London. You can have little understanding of the life in London these days. There are no words to describe the thing that is happening. The courage of the people, the flash and roar of the guns rolling down the streets. I was told that this building had once stabled 80 horses. There were 1,200 men in it, fired to a bunk. The stink was beyond all description. As we walked out into the courtyard, a man fell dead. I saw it, but will not describe it. This is London. Tonight, London is a city of song and celebration and thanksgiving. The organized killing has ended in Europe. The young men of many nations have suffered, sacrificed, and achieved victory. The coming months and years will reveal what will be done with that victory? The young man became famous almost overnight, the first truly great journalist in the first truly new form of journalism. But there was rather little in his background to suggest what he would become. He was born in 1908 in Greensboro, North Carolina, christened Egbert, which he changed just as fast as he could to Edward. He was graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Washington State in 1930. Then came the job jobs in international education, then the CBS mission to London. After the war in 52, Murrow and Fred W. Friendly started a TV series called See It Now. CBS Television, in cooperation with its affiliated television stations, presents the distinguished reporter and news analyst, Edward R. Murrow, in See It Now, edited by Mr. Murrow and Fred W. Friendly. We are as newcomers to this medium, rather impressed by the whole thing. Impressed, for example, that I can turn to Don Hewitt here and say, uh, Don, will you push a button and bring in the Atlantic Coast? Uh, this is camera one at a point of vantage on Governor's Island. Good, thank you very much. Now, on monitor two, may we have the Pacific Coast, please? Hello, New York. This is the Golden Gate, the waters of San Francisco Bay leading out to the Pacific Ocean. It's rather hazy out here, Mr. Murrow. 
Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. We, for our part, are considerably impressed. For the first time, man has been able to sit at home and look at two oceans at the same time.